label this night um, the what we want, when we want, you know, an overview of the food system. Because I think we need to remind ourselves in some respects of what this food system is about that we're going to talk about this semester. I will open up with sort of a quick, maybe not data dump in some respects on the food system. So just reminding us of some of the larger themes. And then I'm going to hand over to two colleagues in the local universities who I'm pleased to have here tonight. And finally, Brian Donahue is Associate Professor of American Environmental Studies and the Director of the Environmental Studies Program at Brandeis University. Um, his primary interest is the history and prospects of human engagement with the land, sustainable agriculture, and regional environmental history. He's author of two award-winning books, Reclaiming the Commons, Community Farms and Forests in New England, uh, New England Town, 1999 book, and his The Great Meadow, Farmers in the Land and Colonial Conquer, 2004, book I first got to know uh, Brian's work. He's also co-authored an important 2014 study, A New England Food Vision, which assesses the capacity of New England as a region to essentially produce its own, produce its own food. Sort of a topic he's going to touch on tonight, the New England regional agricultural sector. Um, he's also earned his, he earned his PhD in Brandeis in the history of American civilization. He co founded from, um, and for 12 years ran Land Sake, a nonprofit community farm in Western Massachusetts, West Massachusetts, and was a director of education at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. So we have two really great guest speakers here tonight to talk about the food system. So I'm going to start it off tonight. Um, what we want, what you want, when you want it, the food system. And I think the reason why I, I started that way, Brian, do me a favor, give me a, give me a five minute heads up, okay? The reason why I start with that phrase is that for most of us in this country, the food system does give us what we want, when we want it. Especially for most, as we'll talk about gives us what we want, when we want it, at a price we want to pay, whether it's Walmart or Whole Foods. So I'm going to talk about that first, set the tone. What people spend on food. This map shows per capita household spending on food eaten at home. The darker the color, the higher the per capita spending on food. So, some people in this world spend a comparable fair amount of their household income on food. Nearly 50% in some cases. Some people, in the United States in particular, spend relatively little of our household income on food. Let's look more closely at that. How much can you spend on food? 2014 data. Yes, sir. Household income, food eaten at home. Average American family spends 6.5% of its take home income, net income, on food eaten at home. It's 11% if you include food eaten outside of the home which probably has become a growing part of the food budget because people eat up more. In fact, this is from the historical perspective. The blue is income, so it's rising, comparatively speaking. The blue line, let's see if I'm right. The blue line is all food as again, as a percentage of, of household income. The orange line is food eaten at home, consumed at home, and then the blue, the green line is food eaten at away from home. But the point is, is that overall point, if you, if, as a percentage of income, Americans today spend less on food, probably than anybody in human history. It's important that we understand that point. That for whatever issues we have with the food system, and there's going to be plenty. There's an irreducible reality for many Americans that we spend as a country historically little on food. There was another graph I could have had comparing food to housing, 
health and other things. You can imagine housing and health went like this, food went like this. Food is a small part of our budgets these days for most Americans. Not all, most. We'll talk about that later. Certainly not all, believe me. But on average, and in historical terms, you can see how it's dropped from the, from the 1930s to now. Some of us eat out for a bit. Um, the more affluent you are, the more you eat out, eat out obviously. But even middle class. You know. <laughs> Household incomes, 30,000 to 75,000. Certainly not wealthy, especially in Boston. But even there, 15% eat out three times or more. 35% eat out two times or more a week. Now, eating out might mean just take, it might mean, you know, McDonald's, or it might mean the Olive Garden, or it might mean, but it could be, you know, a, a, a higher end restaurant, but eating out as opposed to eating at home. Now, it also means lunch, breakfast, it could be just, you know, it could be anything. It doesn't mean dinner necessarily, but that, on average, people eat out a fair bit, although less than the Japanese, by the way. I had another graph. Japanese eat out all the time because, you know, it's, you know, they entertain mostly at restaurants. Young people, Obviously, more than older people. But the point is that, you know, that not only do we you know, spend relatively little on food, we eat out more than we used to. We eat out a lot more. Overarching thing, as a result. And this is the point I want to drive home. To get us started. For most of us, we are accustomed to a food system that delivers whatever we want, when we want it, at a price we are willing to pay. We're accustomed now, especially in urban America, more than we realize, to ubiquitous, plentiful, convenient, diverse food. You want Thai? You got Thai. You want Himalayan? You can even get Himalayan. Now, Indian? Sure. Yeah. Name it, you can find it. We want convenience. We want variety. We want taste. We want cost. We want, you know, we want convenient, for very tasty, and inexpensive. So, you know. uh, and increasingly, however, we also worry about the, we also have concerns about the conditions of production. So we want all these things, and we are increasingly concerned as a society about the conditions under which our food is produced. Okay, so that's the backdrop. What kind of food system, though, meets these demands? As it's important to lay out these things. What kind of food system meets these demands? I'll go real quickly. I'm going to give myself 10 minutes, actually. Because um, it's 20 minutes before the day. Or put it another way, how is this still possible? I looked this up. This is still a price. Yeah. How is this possible? The consumer doesn't pay. Well, don't, don't. The consumer doesn't pay <laughs> the full cost. We know the economist just spoke up. The economist in the front row said the, that the consumer doesn't pay the full cost. Exactly. We'll get to that later. But if you think about it, this is a more remarkable. Yes, we know that there's a lot of hidden costs that we don't pay up front, but the fact that you can get a burger for a dollar at McDonald's is reframing really the food system at its best and its worst in many respects. So, what kind of food system is this? It's industrial. We know that. All the things about industrialization, producing cars, producing food. Economies of scale, specialization, mechanization. There's high input needs, energy, capital, technology, labor at some points, not so much at other points. What percentage of Americans work the farm? Anybody? 2%. Less. Less than 1.7, 1.6%. 1.6% of Americans feed everybody else. That's remarkable. Back in the 1930s, it was what, 26, 27% of Americans worked the farm. Um, standardized commodities, you need standardization, both good and bad. Efficiency, stress and economic efficiency, keeping costs of inputs low, including labor costs. Teleconnected, stress on speed, efficiency, timeliness, and it's global. It's a global system. If you want strawberries in February, you can get them. You want, you know, you want what you want when you want it. You know, Real quickly, agriculture as a result, fewer and larger farms, mechanized, technology focused, focus on monoculture, 
global commodity markets, and on and on. It's just the graph, size of farms. More land in agriculture, fewer farms. Larger farms are making the greatest percentage of the overall value of production. And by the way, by large, we don't mean corporate farms. You have families that own these. These are family corporations. They're family farms. They're huge family farms, but they're family farms. So the term family farmer, in our, in our mental map in New England, we think this image of a family farm is some family in, say, Westport, Massachusetts, with three acres. Whereas in, you know, in western Kansas, it might be 10,000 acres. You know? So and it's a family farm. You know? So um, we get more out of, out of less. Fewer cows, more milk than ever, because each cow is getting more milk. Um, very true. There's far fewer cows. There, there, there's far fewer cows now than there ever have been, and yet we have milk a lot, you know, because overproduction. We have concentration in a few companies. Famous names: Archer Daniels, Midland, Cargill, Tyson, you know, ConAgra. The logic of industrialization, the logic of the market. Concentration of meat processing. It used to be that every region had its meat processing facilities. You had a regional infrastructure. But it became cheaper, faster to produce all the beef from the Midwest and slaughter all the beef from the Midwest and ship it in frozen boxes from the Midwest. Or in the case of pigs, the south of North Carolina. Doing, as, as Brian might mention, New England has very little processing capacity. You know, so if you want local meat, the problem is you may not have processing capacity, although they might be building some. Um, and who's doing all this labor? Well, if you've ever been to some of the processing facilities in places like Iowa, there's Spanish being spoken there. Agriculture relies heavily on immigrant labor. Thus complicating the immigration policy rates. And finally, we rely a lot on imports. Um, we export a lot of food. Exports are about, you know, a huge chunk of the American uh, exports. Uh, trade, trade is exporting food, especially commodities. Um, farmers don't want to get into a trade war, so that would be interesting to the Trump administration, um, what happens there. Uh, but we import a lot of seafood. I mean, for, even in New England, if you're eating shrimp, it's mostly from export. I mean, unless it says explicitly, your shrimp is from Southeast Asia, South America is frozen. You know, that we import a lot of seafood in this country, and even in New England, and a lot of fresh produce. You know, because again, if you want fresh produce in January, it's got to come from somewhere. Um, so, pros and cons, wrap up. The food system reflects, in many respects, the genius of industrial production. Efficiency, consistency, scientific management, specialization. I mean, if you think about it for a moment, I mean, we take it for granted. That's how, that's how much that we forget. We take it for granted, this food system. We just assume the food will be there at a price we can pay. Um, Again, feeds most people at the lowest direct cost, direct cost in any time in the history. Primary argument we're going to hear a lot this semester that the food system is necessary to feed the world, especially 9 billion people by 2050. That's a contested argument, though. But you're going to hear it a lot. The defenders of the food system say this is necessary to feed the world. It did in the Green Revolution. We need this kind of food system to feed the world. And reflects, in many respects, dominant American values. Free markets, efficiency, technology, consumer choice. You want it, you can get it. You want that pizza at 10.30 at night? Get on your app, and it'll be delivered to your door. And I know you've done it. Um, critiques. We'll talk about this. It focus on efficiency, specialization, <coughs> standardizes food, and divorces from nature. Beef is beef is beef. It could be Argentinian beef, could be Brazilian beef, could be Australian beef, Iowa beef, just beef. Interchangeable beef. You hear that you know, from folks in the industry. Um, 
Where does your food come from? Well, the grocery store, of course. Yeah. Um, may the system's actual costs are borne by consumers through taxes, lower wages, etc. Ecological degradation, tax, subsidies, etc., etc. Someone's paying the price in other ways for the food system. Maybe workers. Who's cutting your meat? Who's serving your food? What are they making? What are the ecological impacts? Um, produces a glut of commodities at the expense of workers, the environment, and communities, and those commodities have to go somewhere. Cheap food comes from production of commodities that have to go somewhere. Yeah. And if you're lower income, processed food is cheaper in a caloric sense than fresh fruits and vegetables. Thus, quite raising questions of why is there, in fact, this intersection of health problems and income when it comes to food. Finally, argument is that the food system is anti-democratic. You didn't vote for it. Dominated by major corporations and their political allies at the expense of local values and needs. So we're going to explore these competing narratives throughout the semester with a strong Boston, Boston focus. But I thought it was important that we start out with this quick review, just to remind ourselves what's underneath the hood, if you will. What's there? What's the reality on the ground?